Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. I cut you in half. Sounds like things are pretty much as we left them. Which is to say, going to hell. Nothing new around here, but wait a minute. Yes, that's right. Someone's pried open the doors, but didn't take the thing right in the middle. Go figure. But hey, their loss is our gain. Press to lunge at enemies, delivering a tornado blow. Hold and release to build up a more devastating tornado blow. I think this is the only one that can't lay down any traps. There! That one! Alright! Alright, let's see what this is good for. Oh man, that guy just fell over right away. Yeah, there we go. Now we're seeing what we can do. It's basically like a skyline strike, but you don't have to be on a skyline to do it. Now, looks like there's only RPGs around here. So who am I to argue? Might be something big coming along. Elizabeth! On it! For that matter, it might help if I were up a little higher. Reason it didn't want me to grab anything from up there, but whatever. <laughs> oh, there you are. Hello, RPG buddy. Sorry. Let's play War of the RPGs. I'm bored. I'm just gonna kill you. There we go. Man, you got a lot of health even when your metal helmet is off. Alright, well, that was easier than expected. All those RPGs lying around, I expected one of the big things to pop down. But I guess not. Ah, damn. Found some money. Want it? Okay. Well, I guess we did it. I don't know if I brought us to a world where the Vox had weapons. Or I created one. You did not create anything. That's not how the multiverse works. You connected two universes in which one had Vox weapons. But everything exists previously under the multiverse theory. You do not create a new universe. You create a connection to an existing universe. Oh, crap. Sorry, that's all I've got. Man, where's the rocket? Propelled grenades actually destroyed things. You know, better than the guns do. Oh well. Oh, this is what she was talking about the last time we were here. The entire job board full of kill the false shepherd blacks. Go, go, go! And I guess that's one way of saying that there's no jobs available. Alright, now I believe there is something new in here. Here we go. Oh, and that. Looks like I got a friend in town after all. Slate. He's fell in with these Vox Populi. And for irregulars, I will say, they are loaded for bear. Problem is, I gotta help them with their damn revolution first. 
then we take Comstock House by storm. I do that, I get the girl. Hey, a universe in which Slate wasn't crazy. This is, this is not what I meant to have happen. Elizabeth. They're dead, Booker. Come on, let's leave this place. Let's go to the factory and get our airship. This isn't our responsibility, none of it. You just opened a door to this world and we stepped through. Are you sure, Booker? Did I just bring us to a world where Chenlin was alive, or, or did I create it? I told you I always thought that my little trick was a form of wish fulfillment. I got my wish. Well, that's just a matter of there being an infinite number of possibilities. Or at least a number so incredibly high that it might as well be infinite. done for Lady Comstock, and well, everybody noticed me. I head to Finkton, and I hide. I hide deep. The more they look, deeper I go. Only thing a color child can count on is the fact they invisible. I'd like to thank whoever pointed out that I forgot to check that one corner there, because that, that voxophone has actually been there this whole time. Apparently somebody's retiring. But yeah, I guess this is what happens in a world where Slate isn't completely insane. The Vox get their weapons and actually start a revolution. Go figure. This door also opened. Not that it does me any good. All I got from it was a lousy sandwich. Ah oh, well. Got ourselves a whole bunch of stuff shooting at us. A whole bunch of people shooting at them. It's actually pretty interesting this way. Just your patriot. Go ahead. Okay. Hmm. Looks like the rocket turrets had a rocket off, but the rocket turret I summoned lost. Yeah, I grabbed the. Uh, grenade launcher, basically because rocket launcher, you know, either way, it's gonna do lousy damage. I might as well pick the one that's got a whole bunch of ammunition. I guess I did hear a patriot. There we go. That's how it's supposed to work. Assaults. Catch, Booker. Appreciate it. Nice. And they're really pouring out from the left side there. Uh-oh. 
Uh oh. Uh oh. You can't get that door open unless someone takes that airship out. Are we volunteering? I suppose we are. Of course, there's a little problem of how the hell do we get up there. Here's that rail line up there, but, uh... Oh, damn. The question is, how do we get up there? Oh, okay. Now I got my shotgun back, and this is just going to be nice and smooth. I probably could have just jumped on it by turning around there, but well, I wanted the scenic route. I don't know what all the hooks there are for, though. There's nothing to shoot from up here. It's just the Zeppelin, and that's over on this side. You need to sabotage the engine and bring this thing down. Have the turret do all the work for us. Or not. Maybe there is no work to be done. Maybe there's just one guy and he was actually hiding behind the turret thanks to this crate here. And of course there's no friendly fire on targets like that. Fortunately, as always, the fireballs take it out in one shot. That was the wrong button. Alright, now let's have the Patriot do some of the work for me. Sabotage the engine and bring this thing down. Yes, thank you, Booker. You said that when you got on here. I haven't forgotten. Mercy the Lord. Come on, you son of a bitch. Uh, Zap is so damn useless. Crying out loud, he keeps turning around even when I've zapped him. Let's try fire. That'll do something. Come on, come on! No! <laughs> no! <laughs> there, finally. Son of a bitch. Sabotage the engine and bring this thing down. Yeah, we gotta do that, and also we gotta explore the front end of this thing before it explodes. Because I'd kind of like to find out what's around here. You know, just in case it's something worth picking up. Okay, now to get off this thing. I think a steel claw wouldn't do all that much against steel cables like that. Like that did not look like the most vulnerable part of the engine, is what I'm saying here. Seems like we're awfully high up here. Ah, there we go. Man, if we did go up so high. Now they knew who I am. Elizabeth, let's go find Daisy in the factory. Doesn't seem like they really care that I died either. Hmm. Nice skyline, but we kind of saw all of this on the way up here. Ah oh, well. Time to enter the factory next time.
You know, I'm glad I found that Daisy Fitzroy voxophone late. Because now is a pretty decent time to talk about what she said. How she knows what it means to be invisible. After all, she's not the only one. Now, I'm not talking about myself here. I'm talking about today's Literature Corner. Our subject is Invisible Man. The text. The first thing you should know is that there's a difference between Invisible Man and The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man is a classic science fiction novel written by H.G. Wells about a mad scientist who turns himself invisible and then starts stealing stuff and shooting people. The invisibility doesn't turn him evil, mind you. He was sort of a prick from the get-go. On the other hand, Invisible Man Without the Article is a novel by Ralph Ellison that was published in 1952 and essentially describes the African-American experience as it was immediately before the Civil Rights Movement kicked in. The unnamed title character goes on an odyssey from the southern heartlands to Harlem, passing through a series of events which mirror Ellison's own experiences, along with experiences which others had related to him. The book begins with the unnamed protagonist explaining where he is as of the book's writing. He is holed up in a basement apartment in an affluent part of Manhattan, living off the grid, yet stealing from the grid, to power 1,369 light bulbs, which he has used to cover the ceiling and all of the walls. Soon he hopes to cover the floor as well. At this point in his life, he has come to realize that he is invisible, and as such, he is particularly hateful of the dark. The story itself begins with the protagonist growing up in a southern town. All his life, he's told to look up to the white man and let him have his way. But his worldview is shaken when his grandfather, the most loyal black man a white man could ever know, says on his deathbed that he was a traitor for his entire life. He had lied to the white man lied when he said everything the white man wanted to hear. He had killed him with kindness. This makes no sense to the young protagonist, and so he resolves to be actually nice and supportive of the system. And to say this makes him naive is an understatement. The protagonist excels at school, and when he gives his valedictorian speech about collaboration, he is invited to say it again to all the rich white folks in town at their gentlemen's club. That night also features a battle royal between a group of black boxers, and even though the protagonist is not a boxer, he is invited to join in. Well, I say invited, but he doesn't have a choice in the matter. After that, the white men scatter fake prize money across an electrified carpet which the boxers have to cross in order to get paid. But, at the very least, the protagonist does get himself a scholarship for his trouble. Three years later, he's deep into his education when one of the college's white northern founders, Mr. Norton, comes down for a visit, and the college's president, Dr. Bledsoe, assigns the protagonist to be Mr. Norton's driver. Although he was supposed to take him through the nice parts of town, he instead drives Mr. Norton into the old slave quarters, where life really hasn't changed much in the 90 years since the war. Mr. Norton is especially intrigued by a man who, according to his story, accidentally impregnated his daughter while half asleep. Incest made him an outcast among his fellow black sharecroppers, but he got a surprising amount of support from the white community. The protagonist can't explain this reaction, but I can. It's because the white folk could afford to pity the poor subhuman black man who just couldn't help committing sin against nature. Mr. Norton is rather exhausted by the trip and by the story, so the protagonist drives him to the Golden Day, a saloon and brothel for black people. There, the founder is practically assaulted by the World War II veterans who are unhinged thanks to their wartime experiences. The protagonist eventually gets Mr. Norton back to the campus, but once there, Dr. Bledsoe tears him a new one, 
for letting the nice, rich, white northerner see all the terrible aspects of the southern black experience. Everybody then listens to a nice speech about the college's original founder, and although the college and the founder's names are left unsaid, it's fairly clear from the context that it's the Tuskegee Institute, which is the author's alma mater, and Booker T. Washington, a man who was famous for advocating education, entrepreneurship, and collaboration with the white man, and yet who secretly funded desegregation and voting rights efforts. Anyway, the protagonist is suspended for his actions, but Dr. Bledsoe gives him a few letters of recommendation and sends him up north to New York City to find a job until he can maybe come back the next year. However, it turns out that the letters of recommendation actually say string this poor idiot along for as long as possible. And so the protagonist gives up and accepts an offer to work at a paint factory. There's some rather direct allegory at this point, where it turns out that the paint, which is as white as white can be, needs a drop of a black chemical in order to reach that perfect color. And then the protagonist screws up and turns everything a shade of gray. He's then reassigned to help the old black man who basically created the engine that drives the plant, but he accidentally gets in the middle of a dispute between the old man and the workers' union, which wants to replace the guy with an Italian. The two men fight, the engine explodes, and the protagonist wakes up in the factory hospital, where they perform electric shock experiments on him really just because they can. Afterwards, they give him a little money and send him on his way. But what they didn't give him was time to recover, and so it's not long before he collapses on the street. Some helpful pedestrians pick the protagonist up and take him to Mary, a sympathetic landlady who takes care of him for several months, whether he's got rent money or not. Eventually, he comes across an elderly couple being forcibly ejected from their home, and without planning anything, he gets up in front of the crowd who showed up to watch and gives a speech which inspires them to drag the old couple's furniture back into their apartment. The movers and the deputy be damned. The spectacle gets him the attention of the Brotherhood, an anti-authority organization which isn't meant to be any specific ideology, but is basically Marxism, because at one point Ralph Ellison was a Marxist. The Brotherhood has need of the protagonist, an intelligent, charismatic black man who can win Harlem to their cause. He isn't their first black recruit, but he does show the most promise. In the course of his work for the Brotherhood, the protagonist meets Todd Clifton, the Harlem youth leader, Ross the ex-hoarder, a black nationalist who gives speeches on a ladder, and Brother Jack, the local leader of a nominally leaderless organization. He encounters a drunken man who expects him to sing a song, and another man who expects him to not sing a song, because that would be stereotypical. When he's reassigned outside of Harlem because he's getting too much personal attention, and instead spends his time speaking about women's rights, he's seduced by an upper-class woman who expects him to ravage her like some kind of savage brute. When the protagonist returns to Harlem, he finds that the situation has deteriorated, since without him, the Brotherhood has basically ignored the neighborhood. Todd Clifton has left the movement, and has reduced himself to selling Sambo dolls, cardboard and rubber band puppets which are about as racist as you can get. The protagonist is enraged when he sees Todd doing this, but he holds himself back long enough for a police officer to come along, harass Clifton for not having a permit, and then shoot him dead after a brief struggle. The protagonist decides to hold a funeral for Todd Clifton, and to bring all of Harlem to mourn with him. Despite Clifton's fall, he was widely respected, and the protagonist needs something to bring Harlem back to the Brotherhood's side. In response, Brother Jack is furious that he acted without authorization, and at this point, the protagonist realizes what his grandfather meant. By telling the white man that everything is fine, it distracts him from the truth that everything is not fine, that the anger of the black community is building up to a boil. And if the white man is distracted at a crucial point, 
he won't be able to stop what comes next. And so the protagonist becomes a racial double agent, reporting exactly what the Brotherhood wants to hear. Meanwhile, Ras the Exhorter sends his goons against the protagonist since the Brotherhood is ignoring Harlem's issues. To evade them, the protagonist dons a wide-brimmed hat and dark glasses. But in his disguise, he's mistaken for Reinhardt, a man who seems to be everything to everyone. A bookie, a thief, a pimp, a lover, even a reverend. As Harlem burns in a riot sparked by Todd Clifton's funeral, and fed by the Brotherhood's inaction and Ross the Exhorter's militant nationalism, the protagonist realizes two more things. First, that the Brotherhood was ignoring Harlem on purpose to goad them into a riot. And when he thought he was playing them, they were actually playing him. Second, he finally realizes that he is invisible. No one sees him for him. All they see is just another black man. And whatever they think a black man ought to be, they project onto him. Even other black folks, even those who are sympathetic to him, are guilty of doing this. And so he has spent his time since the riot underground, in the darkness and in the light. And only now does he feel like he can finally re-emerge and present himself to the world as nothing more nor less than himself. Personal Thoughts We're skipping over the analysis this time because the book is allegorical and direct enough that it basically analyzes itself. Instead, I'd like to make a bit of an addendum to something I said before. In Early Flight Corner, I said I know what it feels like to be invisible. Now, I'm not taking back what I said, but I'd like to add that there is more than one way to become invisible. When you're timid like me, you are incapable of shouting loud enough for someone else to hear you. And so you are ignored. But things can get better. The reason you can't shout loud enough is because you're too afraid of what might happen if someone actually hears you. Or that if you scream as loud as you can, it'll still turn out that no one's listening. But a fear can be overcome. It may take years, but you can do it. But if you're being marginalized, if you're being stereotyped, then it doesn't matter how loudly you shout. You are invisible not because you're easy to ignore, but because even if someone looks directly at you, all they'll see, all they'll hear is their own echo reflected back at them. Curing this kind of invisibility isn't as easy as a long-term personal journey of growth and discovery. Forcing society to listen to you requires rather more drastic measures. Thanks for joining me again in Literature Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.